Welcome to Brookhaven National Lab's Nuclear Science Week event, Chilling with a Cloud Chamber. I'm Michelle Darienzo from the Office of Educational Programs. I also have Bernadette Uzi with me to help out with questions. Um, and our guests that we'll be chatting with today are Tatiana Claric from the Environmental Safety, Security, Health and Quality Group, and Alex Gench from the Medium Energy Group. And we'll be talking to them while we enjoy the sights of a diffusion cloud chamber. Now, a diffusion cloud chamber is a particle detector and I'm gonna get that started for us. So it works by creating a cloud of ethanol droplets. So you can see little dots kind of moving around in there. So that's just a cloud. And every once in a while, you'll see these little streaks going through. Those are cosmic rays or energetic particles from space. And as they pass through the chamber, it ionizes the droplets. So they end up attracting to each other. And so you'll see a trail where they went by. Different types of particles create different trails. So sometimes you'll see a straight line. That's going to be uh, evidence that a muon just went by or a slightly less energetic electron or a very, uh, sorry, a very energetic electron. If you see a more curly path, that's gonna be your less energetic electrons. And if you see something that looks kind of like a giant waterfall, that's going to be an alpha particle. Those are less common, but maybe we'll get lucky enough to see a few while we're watching today. So before we begin chatting with our panelists, I just like to remind everyone in the audience that I am going to be asking some questions, but I would like for you to ask questions as well. So we have a Q&A section. You just click on that button that says Q&A. You can type in your questions. And then after I ask a few questions, um, I'll ask Bernadette if she can check the chat or the Q&A function and see if we can get your questions out there too. I'll share them with Tatiana and Alex. So let's start with Tatiana. Uh, before we get into science, how about uh, what do you like to do for fun? Uh, hi. So I love to exercise and I love to be outside. So I love biking, walking, or just being outside. Good. So it's a good time for you. It's been really nice out. That's wonderful. And what about you, Alex? What do you do for fun? I actually play in a cover band here on the island. So I play guitar and piano and um, like to make a lot of noise when I have the opportunity. And also spend quite a bit of time with my wife and my dog and my cat. And uh, we don't really take the cat outside very often, uh, but the dog we walk very often. So we also enjoy this time of year and getting to really be outside in the perfect weather with her and uh, stopping her from trying to chase all the squirrels. Awesome, fall is my favorite time too. So uh, Tatiana, you work with medical isotopes. What are those? Right, so medical isotopes are isotopes that we use in medicine. So our main isotope in our group is strontium-82 and we produce a lot of other isotopes. So just isotopes that are used in medicine. So what do they do in medicine? Well, they help a lot. <laughs> they, uh, they're used to, to treat like cancers or just different uh, you know, illnesses. And uh, they are very, very helpful. So do they treat the illnesses or do they find out if you have them? Yes, also they are therapeutic. So they um, help to find, you know, where the problem is and they also can treat illnesses. Wonderful. So what do you do with them exactly? Do you make them? Yes, so we make them at Brookhaven Lab. And uh, it's a, a little complicated process where, you know, we manufacture them. For example, for strontium-82, we use rub rubidium chloride salt. And then from that salt, we, you know, irradiate. And then uh, at the end, after radiation, we do some processing, a lot of chemistry, and then we test that product to make sure that it's good. And, that, and then we send to the hospitals. And then that testing, that's more uh, what you do specifically? Yes, yes. So I, I work uh, in the quality control group and uh, I do a lot of analysis to make sure that the product is good and uh, 
the GMP is very important. Like uh, we have a set of uh, rules that we have to follow. And um, so yeah, just making sure that uh, the product is safe and that it's the highest quality. So once you have a high quality product, um, that it's going to be radioactive, right? So is there any special thing that needs to be done to transport them? Yes, yes, of course. Uh, I mean, first we have to be very careful <laughs> while working with the product and also uh, they are tra transported in the special leaded containers that are also packaged in a special boxes that are approved. So it's a lot of rules that we have to follow and everything has to be approved. Very good. And so um, even before they travel, so if you're trying to do quality control, you must have to be near these things. So is there anything that you do personally to keep yourself safe? Sure, yes. We have to be very, very careful. Uh, of course, we measure uh, the dose that we are receiving all the time. Uh, but we also, you know, uh, of course, we need to use the gloves and uh, we work behind the shield so that this way we are not exposed a lot and uh, you know we just have to keep a distance and also uh, work <laughs> like uh, you know work uh, faster I mean like not take too long <laughs> because uh, that's one of the also big uh, rules uh, you know make sure that you have everything ready when you are working so everything has to be prepared and close to you and then you just do your work without you know taking off the gloves so many times very good very good and um are there any questions from the audience yet for tatiana anything that popped up bernadette not yet oh, but i'm okay. hoping somebody puts something in the q a I know, I think we have some Boy Scouts out there that might be trying to get their nuclear science badge. So this is a good chance to ask about radiation. Um, so while we're waiting for those questions to come in, how about we uh, switch to Alex for a little bit and then we'll, we'll pop back to you, Tatiana. So um, Alex, you work with particle colliders. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the relativistic heavy ion collider? Sure. So the relativistic heavy ion collider is actually pictured behind uh, Michelle there, so it's a uh, a particle accelerator that's a little over two miles in circumference, so you can actually see it when you're flying into Islip, um, which is actually kind of neat. You can see a very large particle accelerator facility just from an airplane. Uh, but the relativistic heavy ion collider was designed to actually collide uh, the nuclei from atoms together at very high energy, very, very close to the speed of light, to try and study the actual nuclear structure inside the nucleus. And so part of our goal is to do this as many times as possible inside of very large detectors that are essentially three-dimensional digital cameras to take snapshots of the collisions and try to understand the internal forces inside the nucleus as a result. So we were talking with Tatiana about radiation. Um, is there any radiation involved with the collider? Yes, there is. So the actual collider itself does give off some radiation and then the collisions also give off some radiation. So. While the collider is in operation, nobody can be in the tunnel, nobody can be inside the experimental hall and everything is very well shielded. So while data is being taken, we do all of our work from uh, remote control rooms that are you know, quite removed from the uh, area where the collision is taking place and have many computers that we use to monitor the collisions and monitor the uh, data taking uh, systems that we use to actually record all of these snapshots. So very cool, also shielding and distance. So it's all the same uh, protocols. That's as awesome. Low, as low as reasonably achievable, Alera. Perfect. That's a good one. I know some people will be looking for that one if they're trying to get their badge. Um, but you work more on the electron ion collider. So what is that going to be like? So the electron ion collider will actually take up the same space as the current RIC facility does. But instead of smashing together atomic nuclei, it'll actually take electrons and throw them at uh, atomic nuclei. So instead of smashing two atomic nuclei together, or instead gonna use an electron to hit an atomic nucleus. 
And doing that allows you to essentially take three-dimensional snapshots of the atomic nucleus. It's kind of like using an incredibly high precision microscope on the nucleus. And this allows us to look very deeply into the structure of the nucleus and understand more about the internal forces inside. And uh, this facility is actually um, about 10 years away from starting its, its full operation. So we're really, we take a long time to build these facilities. It takes a lot of planning and a lot of people um, really working very closely together to bring it all to fruition. So that's interesting how you're both working on planning, where Tatiana, you're working on planning things that are going to be happening right away. But Alex, you're talking about very far in the future. Um, so what is your project about that you're working on for the EIC? So I'm working on uh, detectors specifically for looking at particles coming from uh, kind of along the same direction as the collision. So when these two particles collide inside the center of the detector, you can have particles spraying all over the place going into your three-dimensional detector. But in certain kinds of interactions, you have particles that mostly just go right down the place they were coming from. And it's really hard to get detectors in there because the particle beam itself has to be kind of in a separate uh, chunk of the uh, machine so it doesn't damage the detectors. And so we have to develop special kinds of detectors and magnets that can be used to capture some of these particles that would normally be very, very difficult to capture. And so most of what I work on is very specialized detectors for studying one small part of the physics program for the electron ion collider. Um, so one of the things that we can study using the kinds of detectors that I'm working with are um, actually taking full three-dimensional snapshots of not necessarily just how the particles are distributed inside of the nucleus, but also how they're distributed with respect to one another inside of the nucleus and how their internal momentum might change with respect to one another inside the nucleus. So it's not just taking these nice still snapshots, it's really looking at how these things can evolve in time with respect to one another inside the nucleus. Very cool. I think I see some questions popping up in there. Uh, Bernadette, what are those questions about? Yes, we do have a couple of questions. Um, what is the acceptable dose of radiation per day? Ah, so Tatiana, can you give us some information about that? Um, okay, so when we have our dosimeters with us, we actually have it for the whole month. <laughs> uh, and also we have the ones that are self-reading that we can see by ourselves so um like usually per day i would say okay it's like a few few uh, millirams but okay let's say five millirams per day like that's when we are really really busy But so like how much often. more than your kind of typical just cosmic rays background radiation is that? Is that a lot more or just a little bit? It's just a little bit, yeah. So like even um, uh, when we go to the dentist and have an x-ray, that's, that's something that <laughs> we get here for like period of... I don't know, one month. <laughs> wow, okay, so really not a lot at all. Right. Awesome. There's another question for Tatiana. What are some names of the medical isotopes? So here at Brookhaven Lab, we make strontium-82 isotope. Then we also uh, work with gallium, 67 then we have isotopes of zinc i see also uh, arsenic as scandium uh, work so yeah it's a big range now actinium project is going on so we can make a lot of different isotopes thank you there's one more question. What is spin? Take it away, I guess that's Alex. for Alex. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, spin is kind of a, a weird uh, 
property of a subatomic particle. So um, if you think about a subatomic particle, they have mass. So we would normally uh, colloquially call that weight, but mass is really the intrinsic property of a chunk of matter. Spin is also an intrinsic property for a subatomic particle. So it can have mass and it can also have a charge, like an electric charge, and it can also have spin. So electrons uh, inside of an atom, they have spin. And actually inside of an atom, if you remember from chemistry, electrons tend to be paired together inside of their shells, inside of an actual atom. And actually a single unpaired electron, uh, its spin direction is what's actually responsible for magnetism existing in materials. And so spin um, is, is kind of related to how subatomic particles can exhibit uh, effects from uh, magnetism. But the thing that's interesting about spin is we don't really understand in the, in the case of the proton, what causes the proton to have the exact spin that it has. So that's actually one of the things we're trying to understand with the electron ion collider is what is the actual source of the spin inside of specifically a proton? Because a proton is not just elementary, it's made up of other internal particles called quarks and gluons. And so we want to understand how much these individual quarks and gluons contribute to the overall spin we measure for the proton. But overall spin is, is kind of a, a strange property of subatomic particles that is uh, associated with magnetism and is also just intrinsic to the particle. Thank you very much. So while we wait for more questions to come in in the Q&A section, and just a reminder to our audience, that's what, where you're going to type in questions if you'd like to talk to Alex or Tatiana. Um, but before we get into more questions, I'm just wondering, how did you both end up at BNL? I know everybody has a really different path, how, how you get to where you are in your career. Um, so how about we start with Tatiana? How did you get there? Well, I was working the pharmace pharmaceutical industry before, but um, you know, Brookhaven Lab is where the science is. So it was always my goal. <laughs> to be part of Brookhaven Lab. Very cool. Now, did you, um, how long did you spend um, in your career before you ended up at Brookhaven Lab? Were you doing that for a long time? Uh, well, um, uh, like um, 11 years, I was working one big pharmaceutical company, then in mm -hmm. one generic company, so, Okay, so yes, that was, a, was, that was uh, a pretty big chunk of your career. That's cool. It's I, good to know I, that you can change what you're doing in the, in the middle and, you know, still be doing really well and having a good time. And I'm glad you kind of achieved your dream. That's so great. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I'm glad to. <laughs> what about you, Alex? How did you get to BNL? So I did my uh, PhD at the University of Texas at Austin. So I just moved here last summer, actually. But I've actually been coming to Brookhaven uh, pretty much every year during the winter of all times uh, to work with uh, Rick and the STAR experiment during my PhD. So basically from 2013 until 2019, I was here every year for about a month uh, working at the uh, detector, taking data. And so I'd already kind of seen the benefits of working at a place that's so heavily focused on research and with so many people kind of doing similar kinds of research all clustered together. And so when I was looking for a place to, to start you know, building my career more permanently, Brookhaven was kind of an obvious choice just because uh, you know, I can walk down the hall and talk to seven or eight different people uh, about the kinds of work that we're trying to do. Whereas where I was working before, the groups were much smaller at the universities for individual studies. And so you spend a lot more time trying to contact each other through email to, to answer questions. Um, although in the COVID era, we are now back to doing lots of things via email. So. Uh, you know, it's kind of funny how these things work out. Very good, very good. Now, was that an internship that we were doing or was that part of your doctoral research? It was part of my doctoral research. So uh, doing the kinds of experiments that we do with Rick um, and that we'll do with the electron ion collider, there are anywhere from several hundreds to over a thousand researchers working on these experiments from all over the world, from all different institutions. And so these kinds of facilities are normally called user facilities. So a lab will host the actual experimental equipment and then uh, researchers from all over the world will join the collaborations working on those experiments and then send people to do research uh, throughout the year. And then they'll do mostly do their analysis remotely um, at their institution. And so as part of my research, I was coming here to fulfill part of my actual uh, research requirements uh, to do my uh, PhD analysis. Very cool. 
Um, Tatiana, is your um, facility a user facility or is it a bit different? I believe um, that it's a little bit different, although we still can have uh, users using the hot cells, but I didn't see a lot of different users. So it's a kind of a different experience. Interesting. Right, right. But I've seen from different uh, universities, uh, but just, right, never seen that actually they're doing work in the hot cells. <laughs> So now um, you mentioned universities. Do you have students in your lab often? Uh, we have summer school. This summer was a little bit different. So everything was virtual. Mm -hmm. But uh, yes, every summer we have a lot of students. Um, I believe like at least <laughs> 20, 25. Wow. And um, uh, well, there is a nuclear summer school and there is a also, I think uh, it's internship where we have students from different um, different uh, colleges or just even different years, uh, like undergraduate and graduate students, where they can uh, do their projects and also do a lot of uh, work and get a lot of experience. Wonderful. So it's a great opportunity for the students too. I love it. Alex, do you work with any students? Uh, not so much at the moment, because I'm still uh, pretty early in, in my career, actually. So I'm, I'm a postdoc right now, so I don't supervise any students. Um, but we do have some students that come through our group. Um, and of course, with COVID, it's been a little bit more challenging. Uh, but when I first started, we did have a couple of students that were working in our group on some of the detector projects. And also, um, we had one student that was working on some analysis. But she's back in Germany for the time being until uh, she's able to come back and, and continue her work. Great. Uh, now a quick break to Bernadette. Did we have any more questions come in? Yes, we have a few questions, but Michelle, Wonderful. before I dive into the questions, could you just do a quick recap on what we're seeing in the cloud chambers? Absolutely. So, um, sorry, I'm looking down because I'm trying to look at uh, the picture that I have here. Um, so, if you see some lines appearing in there, I don't see, oh, there's some, oh, that was good. Okay, so you maybe saw just now there was a straight line and a curly line. So, every line that you see is actually a cosmic ray or a particle from space. And if you see a straight line, you are seeing evidence of a muon or an energetic electron. And uh, there was a curly line right when I looked at it, and that was an electron of lower energy. And if you see a giant waterfall, which I haven't caught yet if we've seen one, um, but that's an alpha particle, they're not as common. Um, and the reason that you see these trails is because there's a cloud of ethanol in there, they're droplets of ethanol. And as the particles move through, they ionize those drops and then they become attracted to each other because they become charged. So you can see evidence of particles from space in our video. Thank you. Okay, a question for Tatiana. Uh, what isotope is the least stable? Californium, plutonium, or uranium? Oh, I have to check my knowledge. I have to Google. <laughs> I can back to, get back to you later. Okay, thank you. Um, another question for you. How many different isotopes do you deal with in a day? Well, it can be like two, three, so during our production season, which is usually from January to July, so we would make strontium-82 like every, every month. And then we would make also yttrium-88. But yttrium-88 is a very fast process. So like at least two at the same day, it's happening. It can be more, but at least two. <laughs> All right, thank you. And one more question for you. What are hot cells? Hot cells are our main equipment, I can say. 
uh, those like uh, boxes that we have our radioactive material in. So we work behind them. So everything is shielded. We have also a glass window that we can see through. And then the operators are using manipulators to handle the product inside of those hot boxes. So like I can say like closed, closed areas that are very shielded so that radiation cannot escape. <laughs> Thank you. And Alex, I'll toss this one to you. How do these experiments and studies affect us? What is the importance? So why, why is your experiment relevant? The, the importance is kind of twofold. So um, the, the main thing is that the more we understand about how nature actually works, the better we can actually use it for something in the future. And a lot of the times the application is not known until decades after the research has actually been completed. Um, in the past, what has generally happened is, um, you know, someone will propose some kind of, uh, you know, theoretical uh, concept, and then it gets tested experimentally a few decades later to be confirmed. So Einstein's theory of relativity is a great example of this. So he proposed this in the early 1900s, and we didn't actually start making use of it, you know, in, in a you know, real application until more, more close to the modern day. So our GPS systems on our phones actually rely very heavily on the uh, general theory of relativity and its corrections to uh, Newton's gravitation. Um, the stuff that we're doing now is a lot more complicated than what was being done in the early 1900s. And so it could be a very long time until we have a, a specific direct application. But the second thing that's really important is the offshoot technologies that come from the research that we do. So the particle detectors that we develop, the computational systems that we develop and the methods that we develop, as well as all the training that is done to do this work, it really produces a lot of side benefits that end up being very useful. Uh, so one good example, uh, just from particle accelerators in general, that's related to the medical stuff that, that Tatiana and the folks at the um, isotope facility do, is particle accelerators are actually now used to treat cancer. And so and MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston actually uses a proton accelerator to do targeted uh, cancer therapy. And so my grandmother actually was a recipient of that therapy about 10 years ago and it, it uh, got rid of her stage two lung cancer. Um, and so a lot of the stuff that we do, the actual research is a bit more uh, long-term, but there's lots of benefits that come from doing the research that can be very helpful in today's uh, world. Thank you. And Michelle, just two quick questions for you. Yeah. Um, you had mentioned particles in space. Does that mean that there is matter in space? Oh, yeah. So you have things like, um, you know, just stars in general, right? Our sun is giving off radiation all the time. Um, we see it in the form of the visible light. Um, but anything like uh, supernovas, they are giving off tons of particles and they just shoot out in all directions. And so those eventually are going to bump into us at some point. Our atmosphere keeps us really safe. Um, so like the big stuff doesn't usually make it down. It usually bumps into things like nitrogen in the air, um, but it could be coming from many sources in space because it's just any particles that happen to fly by and bump into the earth. Okay, and the, the last question for you, how is the cloud chamber that we're all looking at related to the science of Rick? Ah, I'm gonna end up throwing that one at Alex, I think. But um, just to start, it's a particle detector, just like anything that they work with. Um, of course, it's a very simple one. Um, the real detector in this case is your eyes, right? You're looking at it and you're seeing where the particles go through. Um, but they have tons and tons of sensors that pick up everything electronically. And I think, Alex, you can probably say a little bit more about how those work. Sure. So, so cloud chambers are actually a, a pretty old technology um, from like the 50s or 60s. Um, so cloud chambers, and then they have a, another, another friend called the bubble chamber that's a little bit uh, different, but similar concept. Uh, nowadays, we take uh, these particle collision events so rapidly that a cloud chamber would never really be able to keep up. Uh, not to mention that if you take a single heavy ion collision from Rick and try to display it in this cloud chamber, you would just see nothing but uh, thousands of trails going through there and not be able to see really anything specific. 
We still, however, do use particle detectors that essentially have um, gas that's being ionized by charged particles, but we also apply electric and magnetic fields to those volumes of gas. The electric fields pull the ions apart so you can get the electrons and the ions striking uh, some metal essentially that can be used to read out the charge and read out how much energy is being deposited. Uh, and then the magnetic field can actually be used for when the charged particles are going through, it'll bend in a different direction depending on their charge. So you can figure out what the charge of the particle is based on the direction it bends. And so the cloud chamber, even though it's an old technology, the basic principle of how a cloud chamber works is still applied to the stuff that we're using today. We're just using uh, much more complicated versions of these older technologies to take uh, many, many, many more snapshots with lots more particles per snapshot. Yeah, I can't imagine what this would look like after a collision. I mean, it would just be overwhelming to your eyes because there'd I do be so have, much going on. I do have some pictures if anyone's interested. Yeah, let me just stop sharing my screen so you can pop those up. There you go. Who can't hear you, Alex. Can you hear me now? Yep, you're good. Uh, sorry about that. So over here on the right is kind of a cartoon image of a, a standard modern day particle detector used in colliders. And so you basically have different types of detectors that are all sandwiched together surrounding the collision. So the collision would happen right in the center where my, my cursor is. And then you have all different kinds of detectors that are used for measuring different aspects of the collision. So uh, some, some of the detectors are used to extract the momentum of the particle and also the charge that it has. Some of them are actually used to, to calculate the, the energy the particle is carrying as it goes through. And so if you look on it side on, so this is the same picture, I just rotated it and I'm looking at it directly down the beam pipe. So the particles are coming in and out of the page here. You can see that different detectors are used for measuring different types of particles in different ways. And so uh, you can imagine the cloud chamber being one type of detector potentially being used uh, more or less in one of these more complicated modern day experiments. And so at RIC, we have the uh, STAR experiment. So this is actually a real experiment that's operating right now at RIC, although we just entered um, the shutdown phase to do maintenance. And so you see here, there's, there's a number of different detector systems. You don't need to really worry about what the different uh, um, acronyms mean. But we have all these different kinds of detectors that all have to work together to give us a full three-dimensional image of the collision. And I actually have a, a live display of some of these uh, collisions um, so these are ones that have already been um, measured and are, you know, being read from the disk. And you can see, uh, if we tried to do something like this in the cloud chamber, you can see how messy it would be. So these are actual individual collisions of heavy nuclei, gold nuclei, taking place inside of star. And so all of the spaghetti that you see kind of in these images off to the right, those are actual charged particles being captured in real time inside of our detector. And then the green stripes that you see on the outside, those are particles hitting a different detector and the size of these green stripes is proportional to how much energy is being deposited by those particles. And so, yeah, doing this nowadays is much more complicated than it used to be in the 1950s and 60s when you had maybe just a few particles being produced in any given collision. Thank you very much. All right, let me just take a second to try and get our cloud chamber back up there. Okay, there it is. So before I ask if there are any other questions out there, I do want to let all of our student viewers know that there are opportunities for you to visit Brookhaven National Lab. Um, right now you'll visit virtually with our field trips. That's for grades one to 12. And all you need is your teacher to just contact us and sign up for one of those programs. We have internships for high school students and college students. That's university students, community college, graduate school, no matter what kind of college you were doing, we have an internship for you and we have week-long summer workshops for grades 4 to 12 and the hope is and I don't see why not I'm really hoping for it um, these programs will be available on site at the lab for the summer but that's of course if health conditions allow so I really hope I'll see everyone there um, before we get ready to sign off I do want to make sure if there are any questions in our Q&A section Bernadette we do have a couple more questions. I figured. Um, yes. We <laughs> Alex, have a great audience today. We do. They're asking great questions. Um, 
So why are some detectors farther from the collision point than others? Some particles are actually very hard to detect. So a muon is a really great example. Uh, muons tend to kind of just barrel through all the detection material and be very hard to actually see. And so by having detectors further away, you can essentially put, uh, to use not a better word, just obstacles in the way of the other particles that you don't necessarily want to measure at that point to filter them out and just be left with things like muons that are going to get all the way out of the detector and all the way out of the hall, in fact. So those, those muons actually are very penetrating and they can go through much material before they stop. And so having some detectors further away makes it easier to capture some of these particles that are harder to actually see because they don't interact very well with the detector. Thank you. And what is the EM calorimeter? So the EM stands for electromagnetic, and that uh, tells you what kinds of particles it's trying to actually measure the energy from. And a calorimeter is actually a general thing that's not just used in particle physics. So in fact, a calorimeter is what you can use to measure how much uh, calories are in a food item. You can essentially burn it and see how much uh, the burning of that food item heats up some water. And the temperature change can give you an idea of how much energy was in the material you just burned. A uh, particle calorimeter does a very similar thing. It basically absorbs all the energy of the particle and then you can get an idea of how much energy the particle was carrying before it hit the calorimeter. And so the EM part just means that it's really used for measuring the energy from electrons and photons. If you wanna measure the energy from other kinds of particles, you can use a calorimeter called a hadronic calorimeter and it works quite a bit differently and it's actually much more difficult to construct. Thank you. Uh, one more question. How does pair production work? And is it possible for it to produce particles heavier than an electron? So pair production in general is uh, to an electron and a positron annihilating with each other to produce some other pair of particles. And if the electrons have, if the, if the electron and positron have enough energy, then yes, they can actually produce particles that are heavier, but they'll just be going a bit slower than the original electron. So for instance, there are colliders uh, that have existed in the past and exist now that smash together electrons and positrons. Uh, so there's a famous one at CERN called the uh, Large Electron-Positron Collider, uh, which was replaced by the LHC now. And uh, you can actually create pairs of quarks that are very, very heavy, such as the charm quark, and they are significantly more massive than the electron. But when they come out, they'll be going slower than the electrons were going when they came in. So the overall energy is conserved, uh, but the uh, mass of the particles doesn't have to be the same. All right, thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much for spending some time with us. I just want to pop up the website for our educational programs for any of our students out there. Um, I don't know that that actually worked. Let me try that again. <laughs> Technical difficulties. Here we go. I'm almost there. There it is. All right. So um, just to remind everyone, if you want to do our virtual field trips, any of our internships, anything like that, um, our scientific staff sounds like they're eager to meet you since they have students in their labs all the time. So once again, thank you, Alex. Thank you, Tatiana, for taking some time with us. It sounds like we have some future particle physics and nuclear chemists um, in our audience. So thank you so much. And please check out bnl.gov forward slash education to learn more about how you can spend some more time with Brookhaven National Lab.